Now, we are going to discuss the topic minority rights before the League of Nations. To introduce the topic, the issue of minorities have hardly been a recent subject matter. The idea of good laws or even benevolent regimes even in the ancient times had been often seen as protecting those who could be vaguely called as public against the excesses of authorities. The concept was nowhere sufficiently close to what we today perceive as subjects or citizens in modern parlance. In antiquity, the idea of individual and groups did not have political significance in the way that we have today. Nonetheless, the rights of minorities both in theoretical and practical aspect cannot be entirely delinked from several historical developments. A study on minority rights has to be located in the context of its lineage which can be done through looking into two important phases that include its historical evolution of the concept and full-blown emergence in the modern era. Now, to define minority. From a definitional perspective, minorities share a subjective sense of solidarity which is highly protective of its own distinctiveness. The minorities generally extend itself to articulation of several objective desire to exercise their rights and achieve political recognition. According to Will Kimlicka, minorities are groups that have in common some or all of history community, territory, language or culture. Each of these is sometimes referred to as a nation, people or culture. Kimlika argues that minorities may seek self-government rights or special representation rights. From a numerical vantage point, it is often understood that numerically inferior groups as a minority. According to Javed Rahman, colonial subjects and racially discriminated groups do not go by numerical interpretation of their identity. On the grounds of cultural and political subjugation, the black Africans and formerly colonized societies tended to be defined themselves as minorities. The non-dominant position of Asians and Africans with further subjection to racial and apartheid regimentation is another case in point. Now let us discuss two schools of thoughts. Discussing the history of minority rights cannot entirely negate the experiences before what is considered as two most significant liberal revolutions, namely American Revolution of 1776 and French Revolution of 1789. The same approach is reflected in two schools of thought which are discussed here. One school is represented by scholars like Javed Rahman and the shutter who views minority rights as rooted customarily in the system of League of Nations that was formed in the concluding phase of the First World War. The other school represented by Patrick Thornberry sees an embryonic emergence of minority scheme back in the 17th century when Astro Ottoman Treaty was signed in 161580. The history of minority rights before the setting up of League of Nations can be further divided into two phases. One, pre-French Revolution trends and second, the legacy of French Revolution. To start with the first one, pre-French Revolution trends. It is believed that ancient threat related intercourses Greek discourses on citizenship and categorization of aliens including the prisoners of war and slaves brought out the inclusive and exclusionary concepts of individual and group political status. The religious expansion and threat related migration between Africa and East Africa Oman and India resulted in the change of habitation profile which led to settlement of new religious minorities on these soils. 
The disintegration of big empires and the rise of new entities largely resembling religious units, something akin to states as we know them today, was hastened by the religious wars which destroyed the unity of Western and Central Europe's Christian congregation. The decline witnessed several religious and civil wars during the period from 1562 to 1598, particularly between Catholics and Protestants. The Treaty of Westphalia 1648 laid down principles for protection of minority rights, particularly the Catholic states. One of the significant currents of minority rights before the French Revolution was the contrast between religion and politics. The complex of the contrast was to separate the two. Minority rights in the pre-French Revolution phase had failed to practically separate religion and politics despite brutal Machiavellian rejection of religiosity in politics. Put simply, the notion of rights generally emerged with the growing of human agency as embodying certain inherent rights. To talk about the second phase, that is, the legacy of French Revolution. The French Revolution coincided with the growing articulation on democratization of rights, both at the level of individual and collective rights, wherein one can locate the significance of minorities as rights possessing political entities. The prioritization of rationality entailed human capacity to reject and accept authorities brought out new paradigms of legitimacy in the form of representative institutions and contractual nature of authorities. With the general conception of rights, the idea of minority rights began to flourish that included individual, collective, gender rights, etc. The revolution with its liberal slogan, liberty, fraternity and equality decisively changed the hitherto perspectives on minorities from its dogmatic religiosity to politicization of culture, language and ethnicity. The Marxist response to the revolution has not been so positive since they viewed it as a bourgeois revolution. The Marxian response to the scheme of minority rights paradigm is that it oversees minorities from a class angle, which leaves ample room for middle class to manipulate the annihilation of minorities. Marxian critic to minority question has rather benefited and enriched the notion of rights from a class angle. However, Amidst these responses, there began a strong movement for minority rights. The assertive minorities question the then existing territoriality and asserts in the question of political separation, autonomy and independence on one hand, and recognition, access and participation on the other hand. The revolution could not resolve the tension between status quo of the then states and assertive minorities. Now we are going to discuss the theoretical contribution towards the topic. As the shift from religiosity to social historiography progresses, prominent philosophers who contributed in this regard were the German philosopher like Johann Gottfried Herder who advocated German linguistic assertion. It was Herder who established the link between language and political association to establish a vogue, meaning a cultural nation. To Herder, a vogue without its language was nonsense. The linguistic thesis of Herder widely influenced in the subsequent assertion of new linguistic groups in Europe and elsewhere. Another important contribution came from the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau maintained that society was not a community dominated by a few kings possessing divine rights. Rousseau's famous dictum, man is born free but is everywhere in chains, unravel the point that one can liberate themselves from an existing state 
or authority at any given point of time. The result was the birth of the principle of self-determination, which in the words of John Locke is government by consent of the governed. Once the principle of self-determination was propounded, it was not only to remain a subject applicable to the then existing states, but also helped in the assertion of new and aspiring political units in the form of minorities began to mushroom. Now we are going to discuss how the deepening of rights had occurred subsequently. Against the liberal backdrop of French and American Revolution, rights from a religious perspective were losing ground. The decline of Turkey's empire led to the formation of five new states that included Greece, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria and Montenegro. When Turkey was inducted into the European Concert in 1856, it was done on the confirmation to protect the subjects from the Sultanate. Similarly, European empire-driven notion of treaties were concluded with Japan and China as well. Under the aegis of Japanese treaties with the United States in July 29, 1858 and with Holland in October 16, 1857, Japan agreed to abolish customs offending Christianity. The great powers pressurized Chinese society to allow the practice of Christianity among the Chinese. The religious exports were a part of colonial expansionism that led to human rights violations mainly against indigenous populations. As the time progresses, the first decade of the 19th century continued to witness new contours of rights. The Congress of Vienna 1815 can be discussed as an important occasion that contributed to the evolution of minority rights. The Article 1 of the Congress of Vienna read, I quote, the Poles, respectively subjects of Russia, Austria and Prussia, shall obtain a representation of their national institutions regulated according to the mode of political existence that each of these governments to which they belong will judge useful and appropriate to grant them." Unquote. The framework that was experimented in the Congress of Vienna set the importance of minorities with a growing secularization of the concept of rights. Now, it is also important to discuss the Congress of Berlin of 1878, which laid down that countries requesting to be admitted to the Committee of European Nations would be recognized only on the condition that differences in religion should not be made the basis of discrimination in civil and political rights. The Congress of 1878 created minority rights protection system in Eastern Europe. The treaty provides civil and political rights, freedom and outward exercise of worship, and equal treatment of foreigners in Romania. The Congress proved to be another milestone in the evolution of minority rights protection before the League of Nations. It is also equally important now to discuss the critical aspects of minority questions. Celebrative claims of modern democracy have not fully resolved the question of group and minorities. The functional aspect of modern democracy has been alleged to have promoted majority rule while sustaining disproportionate representation. According to Milton J. Esmond, when governing elites perceive such a threat, they tend to react against minorities in two main ways. One response is to try to contain the perceived threat by eliminating or lessening the differences between majorities and minorities. This approach may entail policies of assimilation, 
and coercive such as population exchanges, ethnic cleansing, and even genocide. A second response also seeks to contain the perceived threat posed by minorities in order to lessen the risk of concerned states' disintegration. On the whole, pre-league praxis of rights, despite crucial enrichment at the theoretical and moral validity of minorities, there was no real possibility of addressing the issue because of the imperial character of world's politics. Perhaps it was only to some significant level that the issue of minorities were beginning to be addressed after the First World War, that is, when the League of Nations was formed on 10th January 1920. Now to conclude the topic, the discussion, we can say that rights per se are a modern concept as traditional notion of rights were derived from divine sources and authorities suffered illegitimacy. In sum, one can establish a link between the post-World War I and pre-war conceptualization of the rights of minorities. What the League has done is to take up the concept of rights from the perspective of an international organization for the first time. There is a difference between pre-League and post-League understanding of minority rights, as there were no minority treaties in the sense that was used in the League system. Therefore, minority rights before the League was limited to religious groups, which in the post-League widened to include racial and linguistic groups. It would be no exaggeration to suggest that the roots of minority rights are to be found in the protection of religious minorities, not only in Europe, where related protections were enshrined explicitly in bilateral and multilateral treaties over the three centuries with traces over other continents that to witness community and group subjugation. For example, blacks in Africa and Europe suffered inhuman racial oppression during colonialism, which in the case of India, it was the caste system that subjugated a huge section of outcast minorities.